we didn't have money and no one believed in us, we went to we went to and got hard sphere for a couple of months. The dots only connect when you look back from the future. After our first like 10 months, we hit our first million in downloads. It's pretty obvious who from the two of us got got to get take a selfie with Tim Cook, right? So <laughs> we still believe naively enough we can create the best food app that there is compared to all of the ones that we looked at. How do you make your money at the end of the day? Hello and welcome to this episode of the e-commerce Germany news podcast. My name is Efe Ajunas and today I'm delighted to introduce to you Mengting Bönch and how she has brought her business idea to life with Kitchen Stories to become an app with 25 million downloads. Enjoy. Mengting, welcome and please introduce yourself. Yes, hi Efe, thanks for having me here. Um, as you said, I'm Mengting. I'm Founder and CEO of Kitchen Stories. Um, I take care of everything at Kitchen Stories that's product and engineering, but also creative, social media and communications related. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to have this conversation with you today. Mengting, today, um, among many things, I'm super excited to talk about your story of how you got inspired to start Kitchen Stories. Uh, maybe we'll start with Mengting as a baby, but we don't have to go all the way back. Um, so tell us a little bit about how it all started. Yeah, how did it all start? I guess one important aspect is that uh, while I was studying, I got to meet a lot of very inspiring early sort of internet entrepreneurs. Um, and it just always fascinated me. This was when? This was like, um, I mean, I started studying in 2008. Yeah. So eight through 11, uh, I did my bachelor's. Um, and it was, you know, the early days of rocket internet and like um, Zalando just uh, just launched uh, with their, I remember at university they had these like tiny green coupons, uh, like little paper yeah, slips yeah. where it says like buy your shoes online and stuff. Um, and everything, yeah, was still like very early and fresh, but I got to like listen to a lot of these like lectures and guest lectures by some of the entrepreneurs. And I always found it so inspiring, like the way they shape their own life and future in a sense, and they just gave it a try. And so I was very early on, very determined to sort of like try and start my own company as well. Uh, which is what sort of took me to Berlin. Um, and I guess the idea to Kitchen Stories, it's really, you know, it's something that as a passion of mine, so I've always, always, always loved food. Um, and then my co-founder, she was always the person who was very anxious about cooking. Like she would cook, you know, <laughs> pasta exactly as the package I think you were even roommates, right? Yeah, exactly. We were roommates for a long time. We knew each other from university. We moved to Berlin. Um, I said basically, I'm going to move, I'm going to start something, and if not, I'm going to stay in the startup scene. So okay. Berlin seems like a good idea. Um, yeah, and we, we were living in the same apartment, and we went through a ton of ideas, but ultimately, we were only always interested in food. Yeah. Um, I loved cooking shows, I watched everything that you could imagine. Um, I just found it a great entertainment. Uh, yeah, and then basically, we formed these things together, and we thought, look, we want something that is so inspiring that looks amazing that gives you an appetite that wants to sort of like get you into cooking but at the same time the instruction and the manual it needs to be so intuitive and so easy that even people who have no idea about cooking basically can make it work and they're not frustrated by you know not being finished in 15 minutes if it says this is a 15 minute yeah. dish so this is this was where we were coming from i guess but, but Interesting is for me, I, I think you studied business and you have this business background anyway, but why didn't you, for example, start with your own, your own blog? Like mm -hmm. instead you said, I'm going to revolutionize the <laughs> cooking Yeah, platforms. I don't know. It was never on my mind. It all sounded so big and good. I guess the stories, they were so sparkly. And um, I guess also coming out of university was like there was no, I couldn't fall too hard in a sense. I mean, my parents were super frustrated with me wanting to start my own <laughs> company. You know, they thought, yeah. oh, that hopefully this is a phase and like she will get over it. <laughs> this was this was their thinking, right? So 
Um, but I really wanted to make it happen. You know, I, I've done internships in these like typical places, I guess you would do as a business student. So I went into um, consulting at BCG. I saw investment banking yeah. at Deutsche Bank. And then I went into a startup, like an e-com, early e-com startup. Um, and just the whole vibe, the culture, it just, it was the right place for yeah. me. Like I couldn't imagine going back into a corporate setting really necessarily. Yeah. Um, and I, so I wanted to create something on my own that would reflect that, that would reflect the way I wanted to work, the culture I wanted to work in and sort of like one passion that we could all follow in a sense. Yeah. That sounds incredible, especially um, the, the, the moment you said, yeah, even my parents were a bit worried. I, I can totally <laughs> relate to that because five years ago I moved to Germany and even my own mother was telling me, hey, Effie, go, come back. You know, <laughs> what are you going to do there? It's, uh, sometimes you just have to believe in yourself, you know, like just uh, as Steve Jobs said back in the day, the dots only connect when you look back from the future. You know, they don't connect uh, when you're in the moment. But you have to find it in you to really trust what's going to turn out at the end. That's that's really nice. And then we come to you, you two, Verena and you decided to start this app, that start this platform, and it's going to be different than what was out there. I guess back in the day, uh, you still had blogs that there were being like maybe individual efforts, like some uh, food bloggers and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But you determined that they're not easy enough or they, mm -hmm. they're not really doing it yeah you know? exactly so it's um basically you gotta imagine it was end of 2013 um the ipad was still a very new device yeah. on the market and um, we wanted to create something it had to be digital right because yeah. of this video experience video was really at the core of it because we always thought like the way this visual works it really makes it much easier to understand what to do when yeah. cooking and it's like it doesn't just say, you know, cut it into pieces, but you can actually see how big or small yeah. they are. If it says cook it until it's cooked through, you will actually see how, what that means. Yeah. Or like golden brown, what's golden brown, depending on whatever is in the oven, right? And um, so this visual aspect was at the core. So it always had to be digital. And then yeah. we looked into the digital space and into the app store, of course. Um, and it was still, it was dominated by two kinds of players. So we had the large media players that were yeah. there for like years from TV, but also mostly from print magazines yeah. basically. And their digital solution was often like a digital PDF style kind of thing, <laughs> but it wasn't like an app per se. And, um, and then there were blogs, as you said, uh, websites and stuff like this, but none of it combined sort of this amazing content that many had with this usability, yeah. with, you know, finding when you search for something, finding it through one click, using like two to three clicks to get to a shopping list or to set a timer and to change the amount of servings, like very, very yeah. few small details, but small features that are very helpful when you cook with it. And so this is what we set out to do because we really like we're maybe also naive enough to believe that we looked into a market and we saw that we could, even the two of us, sort of like two people coming from university, having no clue how to cook or how to write a line of code or to create a picture or even a video, but we still believe naively enough we can create the best food app that there is compared to all of the ones that we looked at. And I think this was like this magic thing of believing we could become number one in this. Yeah. yeah. That believing is one thing, but turning that into practice mm. is another. So the two of you have started that, but quick, I assume pretty quickly you realize, oh, shoot, we need a developer. <laughs> you know what I mean? How did you yeah. start employing people? And Yeah, exactly. So um, it was basically the two of us. And uh, so I... I took care of everything that was product related. So I literally like, I'm not a designer. I have no clue how to you know, use any kind of really good design tools, but I sketched like every single screen, like every single flow I sketched yeah. myself at the time. And we found a student developer um, who we recruited, I guess via Xing at that, at that time. So we just wrote a couple of developers that we found there. Yeah. Um, and he was the, the, we liked him a lot, but also he was the only one we could afford. <laughs> and so um, we hired him for like one day a week to basically transfer what we did into an application that took us 
I don't know, maybe five months at the point in time. Okay. Um, yeah, and Verena was taking care of all of the commercial parts. So we also needed uh, money and products to get this whole thing going. And so she was in charge of calling up all of the brands and basically telling them, look, uh, there is something amazing to come. How about yeah. you support us in it? Okay. Yeah. And then from there, the team of three, um, this is, I guess you guys um, started around 2013. Yeah, exactly. Right? So moving on, when did it really start? start to scale? When did you see like massive amounts of yeah. uh, customers coming in and what did the trick to get there? Yeah, so I think um, product wise, it's this, um, it's this magic triangle that we had for most of the time between sort of me from a very like product user perspective because I really wanted this like more for myself, right? Yeah. Like it's, I was my own consumer, which made things maybe easier in a sense. Um, and then we had a great designer who started with us Eat also very early food. on. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. And uh, he was um, he was just yeah a great designer. He, and and then we had our student developer. And then we but we also hired like the first person we hired was our CTO for many many years um, to come as well. And like the three of us, we we always sat together um, and discussed how we can build the next best experience. And I think this sort of like very small triangle made a lot of magic happen. And we, we initially launched our very first app version in February 2014 together. And I think this really showed, because we, we never told anyone that we were going to go live. And we did this silent launch because we we're way too afraid it's not going to work. Was it work. an iPad app? Um, it was just on the iPad. Yeah. It was just in German. And we got sort of discovered, I guess, by Apple throughout this review process. And then we got a first sort of small feature in the German speaking app store. And then within two weeks, we had like 60,000 installs. <laughs> And it was like much more than we would have ever expected. You know, people kept telling us, you need to save some money for your marketing boosts and stuff like that, because otherwise you will never get any visibility on the store. Um, but this was our first two weeks and it just, it just resonated with people and people reviewed it in a very positive way and by end of 2014 so after our first like 10 months we hit our first million in downloads wow. without ever spending you know a single cent and even today when we have more than 20 million installs 25 maybe even um we never we never buy an install not not 20, until this day <laughs> 25 million installs yes. per month no, 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 in, <laughs> per month, that would be amazing. <laughs> no, no, in this, uh, in our history. And so it's, um, it's, it's, I think it works when people really use it, you know, they yeah. use it, it works, they talk about it. Yeah. This is basically what, what we want to, want to have happen. Okay. Um, well, looking at that and also came, uh, Apple, pretty much discovered you guys as well. Yeah, I, I saw that and I think it's fair to say it's pretty obvious who from the two of us got, got to get, take a selfie with Tim Cook, right? So <laughs> Tim Cook took the effort to visit you in your kitchen, uh, in your Berlin studio and office. And that was like 2017, I believe, yeah. right? So, and before that you had several awards of design and uh, best app for cooking uh, on both app app stores, I guess, Google yeah. and Apple as well. That shows that it really, as you said, it really resonated with the people, which means that some of the marketing budgets that you would have <laughs> otherwise channeled into this, you didn't have to, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, I think this, uh, this relationship with the store, it has, it has been a very tremendous lever for, for the success of the yeah. platform. And I think we can, we can be very happy for one that we got sort of discovered that early on, but then it was also a lot of work and in a way, like as you said, like our marketing spend to invest to make sure we are always on the newest technology. Yeah. We're always ready when the new operating system is launching. We always have new features that are matching yeah. to the platform. Um, and it's a give and take on both sides still, right? And so, um, yeah, this is something that we have done for, for many, many years. And then, of course, it was like the, the greatest honor, you know, to have someone like Tim visit our small sort of Kreuzberg, uh, shabby, chic, uh, shabby, chic office and to actually get to exchange with him. Yeah, I, I find that truly inspiring, <laughs> I have to say. And also 
as you mentioned, timing is everything, right? So timing is everything in terms of uh, seeing what the developments are, what the app store changes are, and all these things on the platform side, on the technical side, product innovations, what the cu customers, uh, I researched a little bit, for example, and saw that people love the book than like the cooking book functionality. They mm -hmm. like to save their own recipes. Um, Hell, I, even I did it myself, you know what I mean? And so, so it's really resonating, but um, also certain times of the year, people are cooking with certain ingredients, certain uh, recipes are more popular. We're approaching, um, you know, the January, February, and each, each time people eat different things, right? So the, even the recipes have to be timely, I guess, right? Yes, absolutely. I think for us, um, a core factor of making this usable is for us always to be thinking you know, at the core, like how can we get more people into cooking? For yeah. us, it's really about building out more confident home cooks in a sense. And so it also means that we need to provide you with the right content to actually get you into cooking. And this is what we are trying to optimize for. Like entertainment is great if you get inspired by a lot of recipes, that's great. But ultimately, like this inspiration really sticks with you or the platform really sticks with you if it ends up to be the tool for you to discover new recipes, but then also cook them and they're a success and you know your loved ones are happy and you can serve them great food. Um, and this is really the experience um, that we're going for. And it yeah. also means that we need to be timely and seasonal. So for us, we look into all of these kinds of things when we create new content. So we always say that 80% of the content that we create is actually data informed and 20% yeah. is, you know, gut feel of our editors. They believe this is going to be a cool thing or something like this that maybe we can't see in yeah. the data. But then 80% must be very cookable and it starts with the, um, the ingredients that it has, the amount of ingredients, the time it takes, the amount of utensils that you need, um, but also of course seasonality and when is something available, yeah. um, locally available as well. Yeah, especially nowadays there is a massive wave of uh, sustainable customers that are looking for different alternatives mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, so there how do you, apart from the app stores mm -hmm. that we talked about, also, how do you tap into other channels? Like, I, I saw that you guys even have a Amazon Eco Show mm -hmm. uh, channel that, yeah. that is activated, and people are in the kitchen and asking Alexa some stuff. I mean, what are some of the other channels that you tap into? Also, for example, Google search mm -hmm. or other engines. Um, if someone has been traditionally consuming blog content to mm. cook, maybe find it a bit frustrating because it's so many steps and it's not very well designed <laughs> like yours. Um, how do you tap into these people and convert them? Yeah, yeah. so for us, it's really, you know, at the core of our experience or where our core users sit, that still, even today, since the very first day, it's still the applications. Um, so still our iOS and our Android application. And the question for us is like, how can we get more people to become these very sticky users? Because um, in comparison to 2013, great food content now is everywhere. Great food video content is everywhere. The, every single influencer can do their amazing food videos now. Um, and so the question for us is like, how can we bring more to the table, more to the table that get people easier into cooking. And yeah. so while there is all of the sphere of social media, of course, that we also compete in, um, for us, you know, the real experience when cooking is very tough on social media. Yeah. So to see the real or the TikTok on repeat like 80 times before you finish cooking it is maybe not the best experience. And so we know that with the digital experience that we bring, we can add value to it, but we need to be available where people are. So yeah. when they're at the bus stop or at the metro and they're like scrolling through their feeds and they're thinking about what to cook tonight, then yeah. we need to be there. So social media is a very big thing. Of course, Instagram is a big thing um, for us. You have around 100,000 followers. Yeah, on exactly, right? so. exactly. Um, and then YouTube is a, is a big opportunity yeah. as well, um, especially the German YouTube market is still not super developed when it comes to food. Um, yeah, and so um, TikTok, of course, is emerging and we, oh, I mean, emerging, it's, it's, it's there already, but it's um, it's really interesting for us to figure out how to convert these people and then 
interestingly enough, um, for us, Pinterest is still a big thing because a lot of people are looking for food and recipes on Pinterest. So it's a really big search engine for food um, that makes it interesting for us. And then I guess one of our top, top channels is actually still, and even if it's an old school tool, but it's still amazing, is our newsletter as well. And so yeah. we have... We have probably like 600,000 subscribers of our, on our newsletter. And so um, that is a really like big mass of users that we can move across our platform and bring back. I guess, I guess the reason for that is when you, even if you have 100,000 followers on Instagram or many other followers on TikTok, you're at the mercy of a certain algorithm that keeps changing and that will either divert the attention to your followers and in many cases you don't even reach your own followers right that that's that is where um email marketing is very although it's traditional there there's also quite a lot of innovation there in terms of personalization and all these things and so i think it's it's still meaningful to use that and tap into that right and um yeah, so that that brings me to the point. We we talked about the channels mm -hmm. and what is the business funnel for you? And how do you make your money at the end of the day, right? So because yeah. all, all this content, I think you have around 4,000 recipes on the platform. It takes a lot of effort to create this. And how do you monetize uh, the users or the business partners on the other hand? Um, how do you make your money at the end of the day? Yeah, exactly. That is a good question and it's something that you know, we've been asking us from the very early days and funny enough, it's like what started out to be something that substituted us because we started so bootstrap without any investor money, basically, and we just needed to find some way to survive and get this first app version live. It meant to us in the day that we need to convince brands and products that we wanted to use in the videos. Yeah. And what we knew is we would give you a very high quality environment to showcase these products. Um, and so we called, you know, we called brands and our our favorite, some of our favorite food brands, and kitchen we? appliance brands. At Verena that time. and me, Verena yeah. and me. She more, she more than me. I was more focused on the product, but. I mean, in those early days, everyone was doing everything. So yeah. we did a lot of sales calls as well. Um, and it was about convincing brands at the point that it's not all just about sort of like performance marketing and just advertising. It's really about creating native advertising that sits at the core of the content that people want to consume. Yeah. They don't have to consume it because it's a pre-roll or something like this. Yeah. They want to consume it because they love the content so much. They don't mind that it is being sponsored and they're still like amazed by the quality of the products that are being used. And so, you know, in 2013, that was still early. It was normal <laughs> like on, on, on like cinematic movies or something, you know, but it wasn't very normal for like these like short form videos yeah, and stuff yeah. like this. Um, but we did convince, you know, a handful of brands. I think we made 25,000 in revenues at the point in time, but that was yeah. a lot of money for us back then because it was like doubling the money that we in total had for this yeah. GmbH. Um, and so it started out as something that we needed to do to even get the products in front of the camera yeah. is now turning into a business that we make, you know, millions in revenues of these days because Brands come to us of the surrounding that we have and we help them to create content that's relevant to the consumer and we can guarantee the reach. And we don't just guarantee sort of any kind of reach that you can, with a click on Instagram or Facebook, can get through a boost campaign, but we guarantee you qualitative reach. Yeah. And so for us, it's really about how many consumers are viewing it, but also for what kind of a time period. So it's not really worth so much to us, right? If you scroll by it and you can count like in your tracking a second or two. Um, we also look at landing pages that have users have their attention drawn to it for a minute or more. Yeah. And so this is in a digital context. That's it's a lot of quality time people are spending with this type of content. In a way, you're putting brands into people's homes. I mean, um, mm -hmm. you you mentioned the target group is uh, you. You come out. You came out with the motto: "Anyone can cook." Yeah. And also, you even your brand name has the letters A J A G S. Um, what was it again? Anyone <laughs> can. Um, 
alles, alles <laughs> yet, uh, I yeah. forgot it, alles yet, nicht später, yeah. right? So everything now and not later. Yeah, exactly. So it's like you're, you're kind of tapping into this target group, giving them the promise anyone can cook, make yeah. it extremely simple for them to tap into the app, use the app, and then they will trust you and go buy the brands that you suggest, right? Exactly. So I can imagine that there, there's a pretty good conversion rate for mm. the brands there. Yeah, exactly. And it's especially about sort of this, this positive connotation also with the brands, right? Yeah. Because it's always, um, it's always in a way a good and positive vibe. Yeah. It's a good and positive environment. You don't have to worry that your brand will be placed next to the next news, right? That might really not be very pleasant. Um, and you're tapping into a target group of, we call them aspirational home cooks. So it doesn't really matter which level they are at, but what's more important is no matter whether they're just learning how to cut an onion or whether they're building their three layer cake, you know, they are interested in food and they're interested to learn more and to learn more also about the product and everything that comes yeah. with it. And it's really about translating it into emotionally relevant and touching stories that make the difference. Yeah. So of course we work with food brands classically, right, FMCGs, but we also work with multiple other like vertically integrated brands that might be about travel or about sports, about health. And um, yeah, so this makes the platform also interesting because for me it's really like, it's not that just because it's sponsored content, it's of less value or something or yeah. annoying or it has to be an ad. No, it's about finding the right brand to create stories that yeah. will inspire people to watch them as well. I mean, it's, uh, we're moving away from interruption marketing mm -hmm. and to a sort of marketing that actually makes sense, that is mm -hmm. helpful, that is adding value for all these people. So in a way, it's like a win-win scenario that you created within your platform. Um, but I also saw, using the app myself, I also saw that you have a plus product, mm -hmm. uh, like an in-store, uh, in-app purchase type of thing. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Also, the community that you brought in, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. So, um, I mean, this is a, it's a tiny feature, honestly, that we launched years ago. Um, and uh, it's been it's been around. We haven't touched upon it much. Um, I think many users probably don't even know it, but uh, it was our very first attempt um, to create like a premium feature for yeah. our consumers. Um, it's called Cookbook Plus. And so the idea is that basically you will always get your food inspiration from anywhere, yeah. probably also on the web. And we never would believe you only go to Kitchen Stories, right? You probably check out three or four or five other websites as well. And so the idea is, but how can you take all of that content yeah. and bring it into Kitchen Stories and have it all in one place, organize yeah. it all in one Convenience place. Convenience and exactly. having everything make it, in one make place. Make it as convenient as possible. Don't just have like bookmarks here or some printed stuff there, but really be able to have it all in one platform. Yeah. And so um, if you are subscribed to that with a click of a button, you get to download this um, into your own Kitchen Story space. So it's just for you, no one else will see it, but you can organize and have everything in one place. And um, yeah, I'm excited to see that actually over the course of sort of um, the upcoming year, we will um, add more again to premium. So um, I think we've waited for some time also for our user base to grow even more substantially. Yeah. Um, but then to now look also into features that people are actually really willing to pay for, which we have a lot of very exciting ideas for, is something that uh, people will definitely see coming in the next year. But rest assured that the base of Kitchen Service, as it is today, is still going to be freely available. Yeah, and I think that's what I've taken a look at some reviews and I can say with confidence that this is one thing that people love. It's simple. It's easy for them to tap into this, and also it's for free. Uh, they're even um, they're even surprised that it's for free. How can it yeah, be? You yeah, yeah, it could they be. They would be willing to pay for something. They like they it. would they would they they used to like uh, send us money. Like it's uh, <laughs> it really we had users who were like writing us, and they were like they were concerned sort of that it was for free, and they would be writing us if they could donate us some money and stuff like this. They're asking like this. themselves, "Am I the problem?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, they were they were afraid that we're going to take it away at some point yeah. um, but that's why we very openly talk about the sponsoring and the advertising because of course 
it has to be paid by someone. There's um, no free lunch, there right? Is no free, yeah, I mean, it's not possible, right? We are 70 people in Berlin, you know, they all need to bring home something. Yeah. Um, and so, of course, we need to work with the brands in order to make this happen. But for us, it's also interesting now um, that we are a little bit more mature, I would yeah. say, um, that we're tapping into other forms of revenue streams as well. And for us, a big hope is, of course, that if we create a great premium product that we can actually offer you even more for the cost of you know of course a monthly subscription or something like this in order to maintain it yeah. but still i think that is a fair deal if the features are really very much interesting to you yeah. in cooking and um, i think also since you started in 2013 and all the way to <laughs> 2023 22 um, you've also seen the market evolve um, at the beginning, you probably had more of a sweet spot. Right now, there's a lot of competition, I can imagine. What are um, so, so the top three competitors for you? Mm -hmm. um, for example, and I, I will get to a second question after <laughs> yeah. that, but um, first, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the that. competition. How do, I mean, how do you see the market right the now? The competition is so manifold. So we categorize them into into different types of industries. You know, there are obviously the media players that are closest to us mm. where well, we have the large mature ones so chef Koch obviously um, in germany is like the 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 platform um, to find recipes yeah. still because just by its sheer traffic and seo traffic is immense um, but then there are also smaller brands um, such as captain cook for example um, they started out similarly to us um, and uh, that's also like a great application for food and recipes. Yeah. So media is like one one big aspect. Um, but then second of all, which I think for for me is also super relevant, are players such as HelloFresh and Molly Spoon and you know like all of these delivery services that also make life very much easier when it comes to food and cooking. Yeah. Um, then uh, there is um, this like the third category. I mean, there's five categories. So there's the, <laughs> the third category of, you know, the Netflix and Amazons and stuff just by their amazing food content that they have. They're grabbing yeah. this part of the attention that we are all fighting for, which yeah. is the interest in like new inspiration when it comes to food and recipes. Um, there is uh, the, the fourth category, which to me is... Um, everything that's FMCG and food, right? Yeah. So from your frozen pizza to your ready to go spaghettis. So anything that takes away the ease of cooking, sort yeah. of, right? And so this is also something um, that's interesting. And for me, sort of lastly, but for me, what's, what is probably our, our almost, I don't know if it's biggest competition, maybe it's also a little bit the most interesting and intriguing competition is this landscape of new food influencers yeah. out there. They are so fast. Um, they have such loyal followers around the globe. Um, they're creating you know, new content, their personal stories, their personal branding. Um, it, it gives you this very much connectedness to the person. Um, and of course, it's it's nothing that we would in this way like directly compete with because it's not about one person, yeah. right? Um, but the way they're approaching the people and the way they're teaching them also how to cook um, is, is very interesting also mm. um, to the same target group. Could it, I mean, you do have this community could it, and you work with um, famous cooks like Jamie Oliver mm. and all that stuff. Um, could it be an idea to also embed influencers within your platform yeah. and maybe have some sort of an affiliate model if, uh, if you don't have that already? Yeah, of course. It's something that we've been looking into, especially over the course of this year. But next year, there will be even more to come. I mean, yeah. if you can't fight, uh, if you can't fight them, you know, like obviously bring them all on board. Uh, no, but we are we are connected well with a lot of them. And the interesting part is, of course, like how can we benefit off of each other, right? Yeah. It's like we we have a very loyal audience on our applications and the reach there is very easily targeted. So we can provide you with more, of course, more reach, more followers as yeah. an influencer as well. And on the other hand, if you come onto our platform, you can, of course, bring us also more of your audience, yeah. but you can also put sort of the amazing content that you've created in a technical platform that makes it available at all times to your followers if they want to cook something. I mean, um, when yeah. YouTube 
um, back in the day, uh, I think it was early 2000s when YouTube um, emerged, it was just cat videos, right? Mm -hmm. So cat videos and some parts of a TV series. And uh, big companies like Time Warner and everything, they didn't really believe that YouTube would kick off so much mm -hmm. that it did over the years. Whereas Google saw an opportunity because um, Google, unlike the big, uh, big companies like Time Warner, uh, they, they didn't assume that the viewer is a couch potato. Uh, mm. they, 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 Google believed that they would come in and also create content themselves, yeah. you know, user generated content. And we see what that took, you know, mm. back then Google uh, purchased YouTube for 1.5 billion, I think yeah. it was the cheapest deal of all time. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, so in that sense, it's inspiring and seeing that vision. Um, but at the same time, you, in most cases, especially for startups, you need like a money generating uh, engine today, you know, yeah. like how do you find yeah. the balance between the two things, right? Um, yeah, so much to that. It's, uh, we talked about also startups. Uh, you, I, I wanna ask you, since you come from the startup scene, how do you see the developments for the startup scene right now? Mm. Yeah, I mean, what do I see? I see uh, a lot of people struggling. I mean, it's, it is tough market conditions at the moment. Um, the valuations have tanked. Uh, the money is not so easily available anymore. Um, and yeah, so um, catching up on these high valuation funding rounds has has not been the easiest. I see it both um, as a business angel in, yeah. in many places, but then also um, I am a board member of um, Equity Ventures, uh, where we also see the larger deals. And of course, yeah. it's been hard, right? Because no one wants to do a down round, but then if the, the market is just like that and things are being evaluated at a different price, um, then it's just something that a lot of entrepreneurs have to, have to fight for at the moment. Um, but the stronger ones uh, emerge even stronger, I would yeah. say. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's um, it's been tough, but I think it's also, I mean, to me personally, it, it does feel a little bit healthy as well to the industry because um, some of the valuations we've seen in the past year have just been insane. Almost. I think it even <laughs> took you guys um, four or five years before BSG Group uh, yeah. was a majority yeah. shareholder with you guys, right? So, and for, until then you kind of pretty much managed uh, a lot on your own. Yeah, right? so we, I mean, we started out bootstrap, but then we did our first angel round and then we did a series A as well. And we sort of exited, I would say quite early on, right? It wasn't like a classic exit in terms of um, <laughs> selling, you know, everything at yeah. once. Um, but uh, we brought in um, Bosch Siemens as, um, as a majority shareholder. Um, and yeah, I mean, for us, it's been, it's been great. You know, we, we were looking for a strategic investor at that point in time because yeah. we believe that also the vision that we had, it just wasn't the right, it wasn't the right necessary trajectory for a classic VC. And I think yeah. this is also something important for many businesses at some point to also accept that not every business is made for a VC case yeah. and it's also okay. <laughs> there are other financing opportunities out there and sometimes a different setup might be the better fit. Yeah. Do you have maybe, um, you, you've mentioned that the startup landscape is going through a tough time right now mm -hmm. and judging from all the experience you've gathered throughout time um, and probably assuming <laughs> you had some fuck ups as well, you know? Yeah. <laughs> So Definitely. Maybe, maybe uh, to inspire them that not everything is yeah. uh, pink clouds out there, but uh, maybe you can tell us like three biggest fails that yeah. you've seen and then maybe some suggestions for startups. Hey, um, <laughs> make sure to pay attention to these top three um, yeah. things that going forward. Yeah, I mean, top fails. Um, I never know if it's like one thing that has happened, but I can definitely probably tell you about the toughest times yeah. and I think um, for us 2015 was probably like the very first time when it was really hard we just closed our series a and then a couple of months later we saw that growth was slowing down um, and Verena and me I would say we weren't the most sort of aggressive entrepreneurs in terms of like, like as I said we never spent anything on marketing so we didn't sort of do like do all of that a little bit like externally to foster more growth 
um, because we didn't make money off of a single user right away, right? It's yeah. not like we're selling one product, so it has a very specific basket or lifetime value, and yeah. then we can just say, you know, take this from the margin, and then we can purchase it. It was more, we were still looking, like, where's the model, even the business model? <laughs> it yeah. was, at that point, everything was about growth, and all of the investors were about growth, so no one really cared about how to make money. Yeah. Um, and then we figured, look, this is this is not going to work. We're never going to get to these user numbers that we need to get an additional funding and a size that we yeah. need. Um, and if we're unsure about this, um, what what are we going to do? So we needed to downsize, of course, and it meant for us that we we had to pull out of most of our international markets. So at that point in time, we were available in twelve languages. We pulled nine of them off the market. It also how many employees did you have at that time? Um, that's a good question. I'm guessing like 30 something, mm. maybe 30 something. Um, and yeah, we had to let almost a third go, uh, which for us, you know, I mean, it was small numbers at that time, but for us, it was a big, a big thing. It was the first time that we had to let so many people go. We didn't know uh, how it would affect the rest of the company. How would we deal with the communication? What does it mean for our growth trajectory? Um, but we just, I guess took the authentic way. We just yeah. let people know, look, this is not working at the moment. We're not making money in any of these markets and we don't see how we're going to make money anytime soon in these markets. Um, so the only sane thing is to close that and focus on our core markets, which was also um, the German speaking market at and the turf. time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then uh, this is this is what we did. And we basically told ourselves, look, if we if we don't know exactly how the growth path is going to look, then we should rather focus on profitability. Yeah. It was not super well perceived anywhere, <laughs> but um, we made it. You know, we we focused very much on profitability. We focused very much on our B two B business, and by end of two thousand and seventeen, we were almost profitable. It also meant that we could choose who to go with in terms of funding, and we didn't have this like funding pressure yeah. all the time. And I think that was that was a big relief. Um, at the time, yeah, yeah. So this was, I would say, one of the, one of the first like very tough choices that we had. Um, you didn't yeah. end up firing that first uh, work student <laughs> no, developer, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> it was still there. It was still there. Yeah, no, that was. Um, I would say, yeah, to just know when when it's best to to pull out of something as well, and to know when. And there is no point in continuing to yeah. investing at, at that point. Um, I think this is this is one of the the big learnings for sure. Because we, I mean, looking back, it can always have happened earlier, you know, sooner. We could have yeah. seen it sooner. Um, but I think this is definitely one of the aspects. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so maybe you can also tell us, since a lot of viewers are also thinking of starting their own startups, or mm -hmm. maybe they have an e-commerce business on the side. Um, you know, many merchants in Germany have a, they, they start a side hustle yeah. before they really yeah. take the, in your case, you, you just, you said, I go full yeah. force on this and uh, surprise your parents. Yeah. But in, in many people's cases, it's, it's more of a safe uh, job, daytime job mm -hmm. on the side. Do you have um, some recommendations? I mean, maybe like a top three mm -hmm. uh, suggestions for these merchants that, uh, or anyone that wants to start their own business nope. uh, utilizing e-commerce um, going forward? Yeah, I mean, what is my recommendation? I, I personally, I think it's, um, I, like for me, it would be too tough, you know, juggling many different balls. I want my 100% focus on something. And to me, it's always like, it might feel like more risk. I don't necessarily think if I think it through rationally, it's actually more risk. So um, I guess this is something that keeps people maybe back. It's like they, they have a safe, safe job where they earn their bread and butter money and then they do a side hustle. And I feel like the side hustle is too much risk to take. Um, and then, but for me, it's like doing a job and then having a side hustle, the risk of failing or just being stuck in the middle, sort of it runs a little bit, but not really. Um, that's so much greater than if I would probably put like all of my concentration yeah. onto like one of the two, right? Either the, 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 the safe job or the side hustle. Yeah. 
Um, and so I think that... So you might fail at both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I really, or like just being like, for me, the, the like really worse than failing in terms of it's, it's going broke or something is, is to be stuck and not liking either. Yeah. Like for me, this is this is Being worse. Stuck at mediocrity. Yeah, yeah, this is this is worse. I feel yeah. like if if I can't move forward, if I don't see a big improvement, or a big change, even yeah. like it might be very positive, it might sometimes be very negative, but at least something is moving. <laughs> so, yeah. and for me, it's like this this kind of just staying in a state to be there. I don't know that that to me is is this personally the worst. Yeah. Um, and so, what I like to at least tell um, tell my mentees, where sometimes I feel like they they're not they might not want to do the jump yet. It's yeah. like, if you need to rationalize it for yourself, then go down this route of like, not being just afraid of it can go rogue, but just think about it concretely. Yeah. It, what needs to happen? So I don't know, I'm, I'm selling this. It doesn't make enough revenue. What would I do if it doesn't make enough revenue? Yeah. Am I gonna change the product? Am I gonna change this cost structure, whatever? And then go down this route of like, okay, at the end, like maybe, um, uh, it's going to go broke. Yeah. So what happens then when it's going broke? How much money have you really lost when it's going broke? If it's like your 25,000 that you started the GmbH with, okay, then it's the 25,000. And then what happens then? What would you do afterwards? You're yeah. probably going to get a job. How long does it take to pay the money back? What does it mean? Yeah. Does it really mean that you're going to get a worse job? Maybe not. Probably <laughs> your experience is going to be more valuable to someone and you're actually going to get a better job. Yeah. So like really like make, make the fear more tangible think about what it would really mean not just the feel of i have failed and i have not made it work but really what what is it concretely yeah. that would happen um, and yeah i think this this paired with a determination of like this passion of the maybe side hustle or something that you really wanted to do i think this uh this might just do the trick you know and uh I know that starting late at a later point in time in a stage of life where there's so much commitment. I mean, I'm I'm having my second son now. I, I get it. It's Congratulations. Like, thank you. <laughs> thank you. But it's like I, I get it. It's like you have a living standard and you don't want to give this up. But then like make it concrete. How much money does that mean? How much yeah. risk does that mean? Like me as a student, I didn't have anything. I didn't have an apartment. I didn't have a child. I didn't have a, I, I had nothing to take care of. Um, I even at some point, you know, because we didn't have money and no one believed in us, we went to, we went to and got hard sphere for a couple of months because it was like the base for like living, right? But we repaid it, I think, to oh, the German state multiple I like now. I like <laughs> and that. so it's. Like it's uh, I mean, I was very against taking it in the beginning because I thought, you know, I can't have studied and and now do this. But it's such a short period of time, really, um, and like these. I don't remember, it's probably like seven or nine months or something of money we've taken from the state. But in terms of having repaid it over the next 10 years with this business, with the amount of people that we hired, with the team that we built. Um, so it's, it is possible. It's just like, how much, how much do you really want it? And if you really want it, just make it, make it not a fluffy fear, make it like a very tangible risk you can assess. Makes sense. We'll make a clickbait out of it. <laughs> From Hartsphere to meeting yeah. Tim, Tim Cook and Probably, reaching yeah. 25 million users. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that, that, that just sounds so inspiring. And um, to wrap things up, I want to ask you one last question. So where's the journey going for kitchen stories? I mean, um, you mentioned the competition, a couple of different uh, companies doing maybe uh, also the last mile. Um, like HelloFresh could be taken as an example where they also have like product placements and all that mm -hmm. stuff, but they actually provide that in boxes and send it to people's mm -hmm. homes so that they also don't have to go shopping. Um, is that something that you considered or mm -hmm. would like to be doing? Um, no, so the, the delivery of food, that's definitely not something we consider at the heart of, of what we do. We are partnering up with Getia at the moment, uh, which is a great uh, test case for us to see how many people are willing to purchase it. Yeah. I do think the target audiences are a little bit different. So for many of our consumers, they know how to cook and they want this inspiration, they want to cook it, yeah. but they are also able to, you know, change it for themselves yeah absolutely so they will uh, use stuff that they still have on hand that they still have in their fridge and they will make the adjustments but still come out with a great dish 
Um, and so it's not like they, they want or need necessarily everything at once, even though for some this might be convenient, but it's also why we've also partnered with HelloFresh, for example. Yeah. So it's something that um, we don't deem as like our core business. But what is going to be sort of the most exciting plan, I think, for the next year is that we are actually tapping much more into the very personalized experience when it comes to this recipe inspiration and food content, because we truly believe that when it comes to cooking, you know, people are very habit driven forces. Yeah. Most people tend to cook and eat the same thing over and over and over. And for us, it's a great opportunity to define what is this cooking comfort zone that you're in and how can we provide you with dishes that are close enough, but yeah. just a little bit different. Yeah. Um, and while this is something that, you know, in, in e-commerce, for example, is like, normal, right? It's normal that uh, Zalando knows if you purchase this t-shirt, you're much more likely to purchase that pair of shoes yeah. or something. Um, in food, it's really still very old school and it's very analog. And um, for us, though, it's a great place to make it much more personal. And before we've maybe been a little too small, had a little too few contents to do it. Um, but now we're at a size, I think, where we can truly provide you with a product that provides the best personalized experience for you when it comes to food um, so that we know your preferences, we know your taste buds um, and we know how to fulfill this best. And uh, yeah, that's the most exciting thing on the horizon, I would say. A lot is in the making and yeah. soon we'll see more. I completely agree with you that especially when it comes to food, um, it, it is very sentimental, it's very emotional and it's hard to change habits. Yeah. Um, it's hard to change habits is something that I realized my, myself when I turned vegan and I, I realized, wow, it's, it's, it's like <laughs> my heart is somewhere else, yeah. you know, it's like, but then I expect that with the climate change wave mm -hmm. and like consumers becoming more and more aware, at least in that little niche, there might be more and more people that are looking for an alternative, yeah. that are looking for uh, ways to change. But I really mm -hmm. like the approach that you, you change their habits without even them noticing yeah. it. You know, you mentioned that you might have um, meatless or fishless uh, recipes that, uh, I mean, not everyone has to be even vegan, but mm -hmm. they, they can reduce their consumption in a meaningful way to reduce their CO2 Yeah, uh, uh, yeah and we can impact. make it sort of as, as naturally, sort of as easily as possible, yeah. right? It's um, still, I mean, a lot of consumers have been asking us, you know, that, and they're wondering, you know, in these days, why don't we have a filter for just vegan or just vegetarian dishes? And we purposely don't have it. For one, because um, as we were just uh, talking before, it's it's a technical thing. Many yeah. people want meatless or fishless dishes, but they're okay with putting cheese on their salad, yeah. even though cheese per se, is it's not a vegetarian food, scientifically speaking, sort of. Um, and so we're happy to sort of accompany people along this way, yeah. but we haven't felt, I would say, <clears throat> ready our, ourselves that our amount of content would create a satisfying and really like good user experience for vegans and vegetarians, I think. At the moment, there are still other, you know, blogs and, and other people out there who maybe do that better, right? And we want to include them into this journey. We want to work together and partner with them. Yeah. Um, but really for us, it's about sort of each individual and we've seen it more and more who wants to also reduce their, their animal product intake in a sense that we bring them more. So we have, we are producing much more vegetarian and vegan dishes in total across the board. Um, but we're also looking um, for solutions where we can provide to each dish true alternatives yeah. when it comes to making it more veggie, but not just switching the main product yeah. out for tofu kind of style. Um, and I think it's, it's part of our responsibility, right? It's part of, of how we can make the world a little bit of a better place but we are definitely not the ones to to enforce or teach you how to do, like no, to, to tell I, you how to do something. I think that's but the we beauty. want to give you opportunity. I think that's the beauty of what's happening right now because um, people are seeing things themselves. Yeah. So you, if you're a company that is customer centric anyway and following the trends, it it's just it just makes sense to make it meaningful and make yeah. it suitable for their needs, right? Yeah. Um, I like to wrap things up. That being said. Yeah. Um, 
Mengting, thank you so much. It's been such an inspiration uh, to listen to you. We start. We did. We didn't get to start with the baby Mengting, <laughs> how, how things started. But uh, you you told us about how your interest in founding a company emerged, and how did you have this idea about cooking? And then we talked about your su success within the app stores by focusing on simplicity and a couple of things and doing them really really well. Mm -hmm. And then we talked about. Um, your future plans and competition and the market situation. Mm -hmm. it's, been a, it's been so worthwhile for me and also for our viewers and listeners. Um, thank you so much for having, um, being here and sharing your insights with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the E-Commerce Germany News Podcast. If you did, make sure to give us a thumbs up, leave a comment and follow us on our channels. Feel free to also recommend this podcast to your contacts and friends that may want to know more about e-commerce, digital marketing, and success stories. Thank you very much for listening and watching and see you on the next episode.